my Juicy co-creators, Lilu here, the Juicy Living Tour. I'm in San Rafael. Oh my goodness, there's so many beautiful, amazing people in this Bay Area. I it can is just quite see. A magnet. It is quite a magnet for a lot of folks who are, I, you know, I, th I think of it, interestingly enough, Marin County is sort of the epicenter for a lot of the new consciousness work. And when the Dalai Lama came to the United States, he, he, he said that apparently he thought it was one of the holiest mountains in the U.S. We don't tend to think as much of like holy mountains and whatnot, but I do think there is something to geography actually lending itself to the opening of new possibilities. And so sacred sites, sacred land. And so I think there's something about Mount Tam, Mount Tamil Pais at the core that's really um, has a sacred quality that then attracts a lot of people who are interested in spiritual transformation. Yes, and um, so we're, we're going to have this amazing conversation on The Shift. You have something, a website called The Shift Network. Right, so we have The Shift Network and we have several hundred thousand people around the world who participate. We've launched uh, over a hundred courses and trainings now and we have uh, many different summits on everything from the winter of wellness to a summer of peace to just did a one on conscious parenting. We have Enlightened Business Summit. Sort of this, this, our spiritual evolution is really at the core of it because that's what opens the possibilities for a really a new culture, a new era. But um, then we see that the expression of that happens in all the different domains. So we have an up level to how we do medicine becomes more holistic and up level to how we think of, of parenting or, or education. And so each sector of society, I know you were recently uh, interviewing Foster Gamble and he Uh, is one who has started working with the wheel of co-creation um, or has 12 sectors of the wheel. So it's one way to model the system as a whole having 12 main areas and then each of those areas is finding the next higher expression. So that's what we, uh, when I talk about the shift, I think of it as an upgrade to the operating system for planet Earth. And so we have to be the ones who drive that by our own awakening and transformation and clearing, clearing out the old and integrating the shadow and all the different parts of personal growth and transformation. But ultimately that expresses in a revamped society with more sustainable, more sustainable living, with peace, with prosperity, with uh, increased health and well-being. Mm. So where where does it start from? Are we already in this shift? I think there's a certain in uh, I think there's a kind of inevitability about uh the evolution of a next stage because we've just that's what all of history shows is that we've generally progressed. We have we may back up for a little while, we may have some periods of regression, but what's happening now is there's there's the the, the an interconnectivity of what is new and emergent that has never happened in the history of the planet. I mean, you are reaching millions of people with these videos, and that's one example of your consciousness and then all the people that you are engaging with being able to touch millions of people. So it's, that's a that's an accelerator of evolution itself. So it's very hard to restrain that or, pull, or hold it back because once people sense something that's better, more evolved, more loving, more awake, more beautiful, then they're going to want that more of that in their lives. And we might regress and go back into old patterns, but the globalization of consciousness, the globalization of information, the globalization of spiritual traditions is on a kind of a one-way trajectory right now. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that on the largest scale, there's an inevitability to us making this shift. Now, the only factor that's potentially holding us back is that we have the constraints of the environment. And if we are not quick enough with making this evolutionary shift, we can waste too many of our resources on conflict with each other and consumer patterns and actually degrade the quality of life such that it makes, it could lead to uh, a regression um, mm -hmm. on a collective scale. But I, I don't personally believe we're going to do that. I think we're, we are on the trajectory for a breakthrough to a new level and that it's going to be a global renaissance, very much as like uh, the renaissance in Europe was a local renaissance that ultimately affected the whole world. It's now we're in a global renaissance. So what are the signs of this shift? What are some of the things that we can relate to and say, yes, actually, we're shifting? Yes. Well, I, I was just speaking with somebody, uh, a gay friend yesterday, about how quickly the movement for gay rights and celebration of gay marriages has gone this year. Uh, you know, a lot of the indigenous traditions around the world have really seen the, the transition from 2012 to 2013 as a as a marker point or an apex of this shift to a new era. And um, and the way that a lot of them think of that is that there's there's a coming back of the divine feminine or the, the feminine principle. And so you have a, a rebalancing of the collective psyche, if you will. So we've had masculine dominant for about 5000 years and now we're going but to masculine-feminine balance or sacred marriage. You can think of it in more esoteric terms. 
And so when you have that rebalancing the psyche, then then the feminine aspect in men is no, or the masculine aspect in women is no longer as threatening to the stability of the social, social order. So right at this crucial point where there's a kind of a rebalancing happening now on the collective level, then you see just a rapid acceleration of embrace of um, homosexuality, at least in the United States and, and around the world. We're kind of at a tipping point year for that. I also see it in uh, the resurgence. There's a lot of extraordinary work now popping with uh, women who are bringing in old mystery school lineages, the stepping into their power, coming out with really edgy, bold books. Um, like they just read a book called Red Hot and Holy, uh, Sarah Beek, fantastic book. Um, there's And then there's the whole... Um, you know, there's the One Billion Rising movement uh, that Eve Ensler helped to spark. Where So there's a, there's a great surge of women into their power which, and the feminine into its rightful place. And I think that you also see the fulfillment of a lot of prophecies around indigenous indigenous lineages saying that this is the time for the, the res- restoration of the sacred hoop, where you have the coming back together of the white tribes and the yellow tribes mm-hmm. and the black tribes and the yellow tribes. It, it's, it's sort of a, it's a Hopi f- prophecy mm-hmm. that these tribes come back into sacred circle with each other and, and mutual honoring. And we've had a predominance of the white tribe and the fire energy behind that, which has also had the shadow side of war. But on, on this sort of rebalancing now and what many indigenous traditions think of as the potential for a thousand years of peace, that, that we're learning to honor all the different cultural traditions and the different elements and the spiritual lineages behind them. So um, the way that relates on a personal level is I think it's important for us to, to expose ourselves and even deeply immerse in some other spiritual traditions for a time as almost a kind of cross training and a way to honor other traditions. So for instance, I've, you know, had a pretty strong, you know, philosophical, mental, scientific training. And so for me, doing circles with indigenous leaders has been very valuable because the, the humility and the grounding and the reverence for earth. And the same way I did, you know, Buddhist practices and yoga from the East and and uh, gone to various uh, churches with, the, you know, black churches that have a more celebratory, like liberated fluid kind of energy, which is more the water element, which in the indigenous traditions, they often think of the black tribes as, as being the stewards of water. So it goes water, black tribes air as the yellow tribes, the eastern tribes, the earth is stewarded more by the red tribes, the indigenous peoples, and and fire by the white tribes. And so when we can live in that balance of all those elements and really honor the importance of all of them, then we have mm-hmm. peace as a foundational foundation of the operating system. So there's a lot of way things manifest on the surface, but if you see there's this kind of rebalancing of masculine and feminine, the surge of the divine feminine traditions coming back to the foreground and coming out, and then you have a, a sort of a embrace of homosexuality in a way that we never have historically. And that's part of the holding, if you will. And then the re- restoration of these different um, uh, cultural lineages and spiritual lineages. So we're really rediscovering and awakening to a lot of mm-hmm. different paths and seeing them as, as part of a, a global tradition, if you will. I think that sets the, the foundation for a new peaceful mm-hmm. culture to emerge. And then from that, we we can really build whole different, you know, build different kind of politics, different kind of business. So on the surface level, it manifests as triple bottom line business and more conscious forms of capitalism and attempts to be transpartisan in politics. But on the deep level, I think it's this, it's this bringing back into wholeness all the different streams rather than just privileging the one that we've gotten, whether we're, you know, coming from sort of white upper class or something and that we the values that that comes from is like okay then that's the the best values rather we're really learning from other cultures and other traditions which obviously you're very committed to traveling around the world interviewing spiritual leaders in uh, many different persuasions yes i feel that it's really a global conversation thanks to the internet too yeah. huh? there's a lot of though i really love coming to california to do some interviews because i can feel there's this always in in so many different lines of in so many industries, actually, there's so many ideas that come from California, and it's always like, what's going on with between you know the technology, the thought? Why is why is California at the edge of of thinking of breaking through with new ideas? Though there are many many other countries and um, with 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 uh, thousands of years of tradition, so it's still a young country, yeah. and I'm wondering if is it, is it because it's exposed towards 
Asia or is it because of its planetary alignment or what's going on with this country and this side of the ocean, you know, and this side of the globe? Well, I think that, that the great promise, you know, all the, when America was created as an idea first before it even people started immigrating, it was really as a, a place to template a new kind of society, which we, I believe that we had some ancient memories of, of, of a higher path. But there, there's, there's a, it, it can take a lot to overcome the momentum of stru social structures and systems. And mm -hmm. so even with creating a new country, we perpetuated a lot of the old. I mean, there was the, the genocide of the native peoples, which oh. what it was a major atrocity that is still, is still coloring how we are today. And um, there was like the, you know, importation of slavery and that mm -hmm. tore the country apart and, you know, and really trying to hang on to some of those old structures and some of the old structures from social, social, social economic structures and class systems. And so you see more of that on the East Coast. And what happened is there was sort of a gradual selection for people who would go further and further and further to a to the edge. And so they're like trying to move away from the old. So you, you get kind of an evolution of consciousness westward because the people who are more vested in the old structures have tended to either st stayed in Europe or they stayed on the East Coast. And gradually it was only the people who were willing to go further and further out of the box mm -hmm. that ended up on the, on the West Coast. So you end up with a culture that has doesn't have the deep roots as much. It doesn't have as much cultural baggage to overcome and then becomes kind of like this place where people can experiment and, and do new stuff. And then that becomes an attractor for people around the world. And then by the time you start broadcasting that with the internet and with multimedia, then it becomes like high prestige and high value. So you end up with this state in particular having a disproportionate effect on the consciousness of the whole world because it's sort of aggregated a lot of the pioneering thinkers and innovators together. Now, with that said, I think that um, mm -hmm. we're probably past apex of that because what's happening now is that that momentum is spreading around the world in all sorts of beautiful ways. You know, I was in China this year. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a great flowering of new consciousness in China. Like, you know, these kind of books and perspectives are really, are really op are people are opening up to. It's like we've been, we were in Bali earlier this year. It's like in many ways I feel like Bali is a far more sacred whole culture than we have in California. Mm -hmm. You see things happening. Uh, you know, we're going to be in Israel soon. There's amazing peace groups that are that are coming together there. So there's a great flowering of this new culture everywhere, oh, yeah. and um, and I think that each country and culture has its unique contribution. So we don't want to on the no. we want to honor California's kind of yeah. pioneering spirit, but it's also to have that the emergence of this yeah. global holistic sacred culture. It's going to take the gifts of each country. And so I think it's useful to think about what is each culture's gift to this to this emergent order. And and I, I did a talk on that in China and I thought about that with like Israel. Israel is like a place where there's been so much um, separatism. There's the wars and borders and, you know, strife over many centuries. And so there's like, and what can, what can Israel's highest contribution be to the emerging world? It probably an Abrahamic family reunion where it's like, it really is becoming the greatest peacemaker in that area of the world. What can China do? China has incredibly deep roots, um, in, uh, in, or in oriental medicine. They can really bring in a deep understanding of subtle energy systems. And they've also been pioneering the way on, on d growing sustain, um, in a sustainable fashion. And they have a philosophy that's very much about masculine feminine balance, yin and yang, in a way that the, the West has kind of gotten too chest thumping over masculinized. And, and the Chinese are like actually more, they have a philosophy of harmony and balance. And so they have this great gift to offer from there. So, so I think that thinking of each culture as having a gift for the larger whole. Um, How about uh, Europe? Europe, in, it's a whole, it's, it's, there's so many different gifts for Europe. But I think one of the things that Europe is really doing better than the United States is, is creating unity and maintaining diversity at the same time. So United States has created a much more homogenous culture, like linguistically. It actually, there's evidence now that when you learn multiple languages from, from a young age, you're actually strengthen your cognitive function in a lot of different ways. And so for, do we've created kind of a monolingual culture here, which also creates a certain kind of closed mindedness. So that's going to become a barrier for the United States in the next phase of global evolution, because other countries like like Europeans are going to have an advantage to really think and act as global citizens because they've, they've had it wired into them from birth in a d deeper way. So then you can drill down and look in each, each country, you know, it's like there's, there's, there's the stereotype and then there's a the reality. It's like the Germanic pre precision, the, the, the French, uh, real, 
real reveling reveling in the sensual enjoyment of life of food of like it's like it's like a it's like a deep appreciation and that's that's connects spiritually to the whole call to divine embodiment like we've kind of gone through a phase where a lot of the spiritual practices were in the patriarchal tradition were a little up and out so so we were like oh trying to ascend to a higher level and then we'd leave the body behind and so but actually it's more about incarnation and calling down heaven on earth and really building the matrix of sacred living here and i think the french culture as a whole has always had a really deep appreciation for the 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 fine beauty of 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 life you know whether it comes through an art or or a cuisine or you know and so you can go into each culture and think about what what's what's a potential real mm-hmm. gift from that culture and then oftentimes you know the gift develops its own shadow so americans americans are really good at innovating and being bold but then we can get arrogant and too full of ourselves right so again the french i think is very <laughs> right. similar in many <laughs> right. in many shapes right yeah so it's sort of like you know and, and that's just part and that's part of why i think being really global means doing some cross training doing some travel in yeah. other places cuz cuz then you get your you get a mirror for where we're lopsided mm-hmm. and well, how we need to still grow mm-hmm. and what we can learn from other cultures. You know, One of the people who does the uh, Summer of Peace for the Shift Network, he spent four years in Africa in, um, in Bush Village. You know, They had no, no money, no running water, and profoundly changed him as a person. And so, um, and you know, he could go into more of that, but it's like the, I think some of the gifts, we, we have yet to really integrate the gifts, I think, of Africa as a continent, our mother continent. And a lot of times people still have a picture of it more as like needing help rather than a, a source of inspiration. inspiration and blessing for the world. And I think that we're going to see more of that in the mm-hmm. next phase of evolution. And um, Mexico. Yeah. Mexico, um, I, I gave a talk in Mex- Mexico City about six, nine months ago, maybe. And um and actually, I, I tried to give it in Spanish. My Spanish is not that great. And I did give it in Spanish, but I, I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes. But they were very appreciative that I attempted to give a half an hour talk in Spanish. And what it was really clear to me in, in tuning in is that, um, is that Mexico has can, lives from the sacred heart in a way that's really inspiring. Mm. Whereas... Um, El corazón. La corazón, exactly. It's, it's, it's right in the... It's right. It, people live from the heart. The the, the connect from the heart. They, there's the there's the the family that builds around that, and and I think that they, you know, what when I was trying to meditate on it and and tune in before I gave the talk, it really felt like Mexico's higher role will someday be more and more as a magnet for. Um, for healing retreats, for uh, personal evolution, for spiritual growth and teachings, because of being able to create a truly heart-centered culture, mm-hmm. and there, the, what they've had to work through is the now is like the wounding and shadow around all of the drug wars, which mm-hmm. is also part of the shadow of the United States, and so that gets p- pushed down into Mexico. But then they've had tremendous, you know, violence and and um, having to de- metabolize this great wound. So here you have a great heart-based culture that you have to deal with a lot of violence in. But when you transmute that violence, it's that's sort of the alchemy. And that is what's going to open, I believe, Mexico's higher potential, which is really really to be like a, a, a country that's birthing this sacred, uh, sacred heart-centered awareness globally. Something that um, Don Miguel Ruiz has guidance around in his whole lineage was that this collective awakening of the giant of humankind would be ultimately propelled from Mexico. And I think there's a truth in that. It's also reflected in uh, some of the lineages around the the reunification of Eagle and Condor in Mexico, sort of a a meeting point of North and South uh, tribes as well as cultures. And so I think there's going to be really more and more beautiful things that, that come out of Mexico in the years ahead. What are for you some of the, 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 the tools or practices or things that are really important to focus on these days so we can be this be this society or be this civilization, you know, evolving and evolved? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I can give you a, the things that I do. I mean, I, I, I find that meditation is really foundational. That's no, that's no big mystery. But I think having some sort of daily practice, meditation, some, some prayer that is more about going into the silence and the stillness. Um, and then to have things that are opening and freeing the body from from body work to s- ecstatic dance to, you know, to really moving energy because you can get each practice, you can get a little too into whatever that training is. So if you mm-hmm. become a Buddhist, oftentimes you get very good 
rigorous meditating Buddhists who are like kind of all hunched up in their bodies and they're not like actually very full and vibrant. And, uh, and so there's, I think, stillness practices, things that open the heart. You know, you can do anything from Tonglen from the, from the Tibetan Buddhist practices to um, more just, you know, deep heart opening prayer. I often just, I often just meditate with my awareness on my heart, you know, and then you can, I think that it's useful to start to try to open up higher octaves too, of like being able to see things on the higher pattern level more psychic abilities. Um, I've done some trainings in that direction. I've also with whom? How do you? More local, I mean, with a with local, I mean, not somebody who'd be famous, but it just feels like helping to trust your own internal guidance, I think is important because all of us, if the old systems of spirituality really res, relied on intermediaries, both whether it's priests or even like priestesses or oracles in the temple, where somebody else was going to tell you what the higher will was or divine will. So we all have to open the channels to have our own source, our own wisdom and insight now, because other, otherwise we end up in a kind of spiritual dependency, if you will, on other people. So I think it's good to cultivate it and trust it. For me, like when I started doing a little bit of psychic training, a lot of it was just trusting the information I got because I tended to judge or marginalize or I don't really know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one. And I think relational practice, I really think, is, yeah. is, is totally foundational. It's like for me, it's like the most change and growth ha and awakening and blessing happens with my beloved yeah. wife, you know, and she's so we we had something we were better at when we got engaged, which was to create temple time every week where we would just open a sacred sa space together. Uh, we would see what was there, whether there were withholds, stuff that we needed to clear with each other, sometimes just deepen in, open gazing meditation with each other, um, massage. You know, we, when we were engaged, we took a year and eight hours every week we committed to spending in temple time together. No distractions, no TV or anything like that. And it, and it created this huge movement of all kinds of growth and clearing and opening and so we were in this very beautiful space by the time we got married and because we, the, the commitments have ramped up we've slackened in that commitment and we should get back to it but it still is like uh it's still a real foundational thing for us to just open into sacred time together and uh i think that that's and i think that there's another thing is just not not also really seeing our spiritual practices fundamentally separate from our lives. Like my job as CEO of the shift network, um, there's every aspect of that can, can and has grown me. So there, when I'm, you know, dealing with a, an employee situation or trying to raise investment capital or design, you know, working on how, how do we stay in integrity with what we write and what we put out there? It's all ultimately a spiritual practice. It's all developing the next level of mastery here. Um, and expression of, our, of my soul essence and other people's soul essence and how do we create a company that really reflects our highest truth and our deepest service um, and let go of some of the things that are old, old school patterning. And so we do things like we have every two weeks we just have a sacred circle and people just show up in a really real way and it's not about business, it's about really showing up on a heart and soul level and so people gradually get to really know each other on a deep level and we're honoring people's transformational journey. So, you know, and I've also, I'd say that there's also, I w in terms of transformational work, I would say, you know, some sort of indigenous kind of ceremony ritual, I think is really good and really healing um, to be part of and to be part of circle processes that, that are invoking a sacred space that are engaged, opening collective prayer. So, you know, workshops is when it, one way to do that, but you can also mm -hmm. do it through more ceremonial means. Um, one thing that I've facilitated a fair amount is called holotropic breath work, which is a way to use music and breath and, not, and to open non-ordinary states of consciousness and allows a lot of energy to move and sometimes have transpersonal experiences of other beings, um, other wow. lifetimes. So I think that some cathartic opening kind of ecstatic thing, some group thing, some mm -hmm. partner work, some individual deepening journaling is also really good or art so I think that everybody's got their unique mix and um, what I've also been learning is that is that the, the whole masculine feminine polarity tends to tends to align people more in different directions like a lot of women have have adopted more masculine versions of practice spiritual practice because that's more what's been predominant and yet my my wife is part of um, of a lineage spider here Ching. Back, back, back into the big ocean. <laughs> oh no, he wants to stay. <laughs> so part of what my my wife is is she's she works with perpetu with um, 
carrying on a uh, divine feminine lineage and they, the way they work is with archetypes so they actually create they create archetypal resonance around a particular so there's they have a, they do a 13 month process and every month they're working with a different archetype so it could be the goddess of compassion and be very kind of sweet and connective and then there's like kali and it's like it's like black and red and intense and fiery and that's like they're really tearing through things or there can be like queen of death and so they work with these different archetypes which have been symbolized as goddesses in different traditions but they each represent kind of some aspect of the divine feminine potential and so and they you know they work in very different ways than than i tend to um and so i think there's something also about um men doing men's work and women doing women's work can be good because it reconnects us with things that are more uniquely like we we did a men's initiatory process uh we, we actually tried to template three of them and it ultimately didn't long term get off the ground, but we did some interesting experiments, and it was just amazing how different like a men's initiative. We got five or six of the top designers of men's initiatory processes together to design uh, a men's initiation, and the kind of things that we ended up doing were so different. I mean, things that really take you to the edge of physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion that really stretch your limits in different ways, but that also really open this kind of solid solidness in the masculine and camaraderie and and i would share some of that with my wife or her teacher and they would just be like wow <laughs> that's so different than what we do in our women's circles and i think that there, there's something healthy about also honoring the polarity yes um i have a, a, a last little question that just slipped slipped out <laughs> um let me reconnect with that because i had some other question regarding we just covered the practice and where we're at Gee, is there something that you wanted? I, I, I forgot my little question. Is there something that is important to mention here that you have? Um, hmm. No, I mean... Please I help. Didn't, I, <laughs> I didn't have anything in particular. I, I would say that... Um, yeah. One thing would, I'd say that a couple of threads that have been interesting recently, we've been launching uh, several courses around the Christ path and we're intending to do something around Sufism and Kabbalah as well. And so we've been learning that uh, to not create an artificial distinction between the new and the old, that a lot of what we need to do is evolve the old rather than simply like kind of branch off and do our own thing and not be rooted to any of the existing traditions. And so for me, going back and reclaiming a deeper relationship with the Christian lineage that I grew up in, has been really valuable and to do some cross training in other traditions, but also to, um, Carl Jung talked about that, you know, when we're, our psyche is shaped by a culture that in order to really become whole, you have to work with the roots in that. And you can't just kind of go off and meditate with a Hindu guru and then everything, all your Western psyche doesn't get shifted in a way. So, so to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're also honoring the traditions that, uh, that we're coming out of and helping them go to the next level because they're all evolving. So there's a, there's a Christianity 2.0, there's an Islam 2.0, there's a um, Judaism 2.0 that are kind of emerging now. Because I was going to ask you regarding religions, uh, yeah, do you feel there's a shift there too, uh, some kind of blending or... Yeah. I think, I mean, there's a, there's the movement towards interfaith. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately we are moving towards a real global sense of spirituality. You know, that's mm -hmm. where our sense of identity is really flows from being one planetary species, being one planet under God, if you will. Um, and even if you don't like God language, it's like it's just one sp divine spirit that animates us all. And so I often use just use the word sacred because it's the easiest touch point for everybody even a scientist sees truth as sacred they hold their family as sacred so so everybody has something that has a particular uh, heart centered expression that they see as sacred and so where we find our common ground is that we all have something that we hold sacred and that we're ultimately learning to expand that so that we don't just see only our own tradition or belief or system as sacred but we're seeing the whole expression of humanity yeah. as as sacred as well when I say the word co-creation, what does that? Uh, how do you? How would you define that? I would say, on the, on the highest level, it's really owning our divine power, if you will. So we all are sovereign beings that have our own connection to God, Spirit, Source, and have our own soul and higher 
aspect. And so when, when we move and live from that place that we realize we are all like little mini gods, we're little godlings down here and we are co-creators of this world. And so we, we stopped seeing ourselves through the lens of being victimized or oppressed. And even though those things are, have reality and that we've needed to face that and deal with that and shift that, but we have to shift out of thinking of ourselves as just kind of imprisoned by circumstances to really standing in uh, an affirmative stance that we are we are the creators of, of this world and that it's not about you know it's like one being dominant over the others it's like everybody coming in as co-creators is that's ultimately we can't shift the world which is like one person or a handful of people it requires it requires uh, millions and you know billi- ultimately billions of people to to step up and say i want to live in a w- I, we want to we are going to eradicate war in our lifetimes we are going to learn to live sustainably we are going to we are going to make sure everyone in this world has clean water it's like we cannot none of those things can happen alone and yet they are foundational for this next era to be born so that people so there's not this existential anxiety that people hold of like okay i'm i've got to look out for myself because i'm going to i'm going to either or i'm going to go broke i'm going to die i'm going to not have water and but instead like people really feel like their flourishing is supported mm-hmm. by the whole uh, whole of humanity in yeah. a deeper way it feels like part of it is also being unconditional with one another so we can be there for another and yet another person will be there for us too. It's like this non-linear way of coexisting and of being there for one another. There seems to be some of that where yeah. there's less conditionality and less, uh, I don't know, rigidity in our relationships and it's more about doing what right. we would do for ourselves. Right. Well, ultimately, that I mean, that is the spiritual truth that's making real, becoming real is that as we experience more interconnection and more global identity and more disclosure of our truth too, people are getting better and better about telling the truth of who they are. And as we do that, then the boundaries relax and we, and we reconnect with our interconnection with everybody. And so therefore, therefore that allows a lot more things to pop because in a way we're, if we're too tightly holding on to just, I'm just me and I want to get my way in the world, then there's not enough space for some of the the synchronicities and magic to happen but as we relax those boundaries and open to uh, a more interconnected space then then we um, we remember our divinity we we get more help than we thought we would um, there's a little more there's more magic that creeps in Mm, and the shift happens and the shift happens and exactly. we're in the middle of the shift oh my goodness thank you so much this was a delicious juicy conversation I really thank enjoyed you. it thank you <laughs> thank you for for having this and thank you also just I really honor people who get a vision that and trust it and follow it and it's like that's that's ultimately what what changes the world and for you to take on traveling around the world engaging in these juicy conversations and helping to expand the paradigm and open hearts and liberate minds and souls is is a great service so th- thank you for doing what you do you're welcome thank you my delicious co-creators for watching these videos and for being amazing co-creators and spreading this joy because you know what's amazing is that this is international conversation and then people just spread that through you know the social media and through friends and then this is how this whole conversation becomes really global and we're in it right now it's amazing thank you for your juiciness big big kisses